Welcome to today's session of JTS's fall series on dangerous ideas, censorship through a Jewish lens. We are nearing the end of our series. It's been such a wonderful semester of learning with all of you. Uh, I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement here at JTS, and I'm happy to welcome everyone and especially anyone who might be learning with us for the first time today. And if you're interested in previous sessions in the series, um, there's a link to the series page in the email that you got earlier today. We are so pleased to have Ellie Gettinger, who is Director of Digital Learning here at JTS in our Department of Community Engagement, teaching us today. Her session is called The Hollywood Blacklist and the Whitewashing of American Culture, um, which, um, which she uh, draws on her her work um, as education director at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm preempting your bio down here. Okay, I just felt like saying that at the beginning. So, so she has really uh, lived and breathed this material and Ellie, we're, we're really looking forward to learning with you today. Um, we want to thank our uh, sponsor today, Toby Deutsch, who's sponsoring at the Chacham level um, in memory of her husband, Larry Deutsch. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, and we hope that others will be inspired by Toby's sponsorship and by this um, wonderful learning with JTS scholars and teachers to also consider sponsoring a session. Um, well, we've one session left this series, but we are already hard at work on next semester's series, which we're very excited about. Um, we have three sponsorship levels, Chacham, Tzadik, and Navi for um, 540, 1,000, and eighteen hundred dollars so we'd love uh we'd love for those who are able to help make this um this and the next series and our ongoing monday learning possible uh, through sponsorship um on that note i will turn it over to tani for a few more announcements thank you rabbi andelman um so just to review the format of our session uh, ellie will pause for questions periodically throughout the class um, we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. You can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman, um, and she will select a few of the, quiz the questions to present to Ellie Gettinger. For any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with myself. Um, the sources for today's class were in the email that you received um, earlier. We'll be uh, sharing a link in the chat shortly as well. Um, so pleased, we're so pleased to have Ellie Gettinger uh, teaching us today. Um, as Rabbi Andelman mentioned, uh, Ellie is the Director of Digital Learning at JTS. Um, and prior to joining JTS, she was the Education Director at the Jewish Museum Milwaukee, where she led the museum's educational efforts since 2007. Um, and she curated the museum's special exhibit about the Hollywood Blacklist, which we'll be uh, hearing about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to Ellie. Hello, and every time Tani says, you can't unmute yourself, you'll have to, you know, wait for this. And every, you know, I hear this in the back end so many weeks, and yet I still just try to start talking. Uh, the joys of Zoom. As Tani and Julia said, uh, I am Ellie Gettinger. I've been with JTS for about a year. And prior to coming here, my life in uh, the kind of, my professional life was a museum life. And one of my driving passions for probably, since I was in high school has been the Hollywood Blacklist. So one of my great privileges was that I got to curate an exhibit about the Hollywood Blacklist for Jewish Museum Milwaukee, which seems a little askew, probably not the museum you think of as being the museum, the traveling of Blacklist exhibit. Um, but it ended up working very well because one of the largest um, archives of Blacklist material in the US is actually at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and so I had a really wonderful trove of primary sources to work from. Um, and, and I think a lot of the themes that we'll discuss today are themes that continue to resonate in our society and continue to challenge us in a number of different ways. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and we'll get started. The source material that I'm working from today in your sources is ba ba basically in uh, the PowerPoint, but the PowerPoint is going to be a little bit more visual. Feel free to go back and forth. And one of the things in the source material that you'll find is that there, 
uh, things can go in more depth. So I have maybe excerpts here, but uh, the full text or a link to the full text in the source material. So I wanted to give you a layout of what, first of all, the Jewish Museum Milwaukee exhibit looked like and some of the things that we've pressed here. But the thing that I think is actually the most important piece in this is something that you're probably looking past. It's the chairs in the, uh, in the view of the, the theater there. And those chairs came from a theater in Milwaukee called the Warner Grand Theater. Um, and I'm sure in any town where you're watching this today that there was a similar Warner something something theater, you know, or there was the Lowe's or there was um, the, the Columbia, that each of these theaters, each of these uh, distribution companies was also managing their distribution through theaters. And one of the things in understanding the Hollywood blacklist and this particular period in American culture is understanding the economic uh, crucible that the film industry was in particularly. So these chairs, which came from the Warner Grand, and actually the Warner Grand is now the Milwaukee Symphony, Orchestra, and they happened to be doing that transition, so we were able to pull them out and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears get them into nice working order for this exhibit. But the thing that uh, that we really felt like it showed and demonstrated is the fact that in 1945, two years before the blacklist and the House of American Activities Committee, this iteration of of communist uh, hearings happens, um, that they are starting a series of uh, hearings, not hearings, sorry, trials, in which they're separating movie studios from the distribution of films. And that is one of the probably 10 financial pressures that the studio executives are feeling at this period. And so when we talk about studio executives caving to pressure, that's the kind of, uh, you know, this is the, the, the nature in which you have to consider this, the nature of thinking about a world in which they had full control of not just making their movies, but the distribution of their movies and the looming threat of that's not going to happen, as well as television and all of these other, the foreign markets, the fact that now in England, they're not showing um, American films without uh, at the same number of screens because they really want to value British films. So all of this is circulating as we're starting this process and getting into the Hollywood blacklist. So I just wanna start by positioning that. Suddenly my slideshow isn't going forward. Um, I'm gonna stop share and reshare. So as I'm talking about this, I want to get into the kinds of big themes that uh, that the exhibit uh, delves into. One of the biggest ones is this idea of fear and its motivation. And I th certainly see we we see things like this today. I'm going to try this from here. Can you guys, Julia, can you see the screen that you should see? We can. And now I can go forward and the world is all right again. Um, and this idea of fear as a political motivator, this is one of the things that you see throughout uh, this period. When we talk about this period, and I start this period, and we'll do a little bit of timelining uh, in about 1947, but the Red Scare is a bigger, is bigger than just um, the Blacklist and the Hollywood Red Scare. One of the big challenges we have in looking at this period is generally everything about it is associated with Joe McCarthy. And we're not gonna talk about Joe McCarthy at all, aside from this moment right here, in which I tell you Joe McCarthy had nothing to do with Hollywood blacklisting. Um, but there were a number of people and in entities, both within government and outside of government, things like the American Legion and any number of cultural institutions that suddenly put at the fore, we need to protect American rights, uh, Americans, from the threat of communism, and we need to do that in whatever way possible. And so it meant in this moment that balancing First Amendment freedoms and national security, that became less of a priority than, uh, than the, the threat of communism. So whatever we could do to, if curtailing First Amendment freedoms meant more better national security, then that was on the table and okay. 
um, according to my research, that that tends to be a trend um, when Americans feel particularly threatened in um, in in terms of in times like 9/11 or after specific threats. Uh, Pearl Harbor, that they're much more likely to be okay with First Amendment freedoms um, being curtailed. Uh, as I said, fear is a political mo motivator. Perceptions of patriotism. This idea that we're going to talk about this in terms of their two sides, there are many more than two sides, but we're going to focus on those of the anti-communists and those of the people who are accused of being communist. And both sides feel that they are very much performing their patriotic duty in in um, either refusing to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee or calling hearings to, um, to get people to testify as potential communists in the role of communism. The media is very important in this, in perpetuating the blacklist, in engaging people, and in then naming people. And a number of media outlets after the blacklist up until uh, I think it was the Hollywood Reporter in 2015 actually came out with a full mea culpa about the role that they played in this. And then there's always this question of subversion versus artistic expression. You know, what is considered subversion versus what are what is actually a, an artistic expression? One thing again to note is until 1952, uh, film was not considered a First Amendment, was not covered under First Amendment protections. Uh, it was considered a commercial media. It was not considered an artistic media in the same way that, you know, writing or newspapers or those sorts of things are. So there was a lot more ways of curtailing uh, what is going on in, in, in film because of that. Um, so quick timeline. In 1938, the, uh, Holly, the House Un-American Activities Committee is established. It's established to respond to the dual threats of communism and fascism. And initially fascism is seen as the greater threat certainly in 1938, but by the end of the 30s, even that, that early period, there's been a real move to the threat of communism and specifically in those early iterations, the threat of communism in projects funded by the New Deal, um, like the Works Progress Administration. Um, if you're interested in this particular history, there's a great movie from the 1990s called Cradle Will Rock that looks at the, the musical Cradle Will Rock and the particular hearings against Cradle Will Rock in that period, the House of American Activity Committee hearings. Once World War II stops, the work of HUAC is paused. And it's not something in this time, everything is mobilized towards the war effort. It's not, uh, people are not engaged in, in these hearings and it doesn't, restart until after World War II, in which there has been a shift in government at that, at that time. Congress went from being a Democratic majority to a Republican majority. Um, and at that point, as this new Congress comes into, into session, and after, if you consider the end of World War II with uh, you know, the spread of communism throughout Eastern Europe, at this point, you're, there's looming communism in Southeast Asia and Asia. And there's this sense of real fear and fomenting that fear about where communism is going to happen next and what we can do to prevent the spread of communism in America. So this set of hearings was established very clearly and the Hollywood hearings is one of many things that HUAC took on, but the Hollywood hearings were seen as a way of really peddling this case of making a case for anti-communism in a way that was going to be publicly accessible. This was a group of people that maybe they'd be more interested in, maybe there'd be more publicity because you're going to have a group of filmmakers, actors, actresses, writers coming in to talk about the threat of communism. Um, the hearings take place in October. We'll get to this about the Waldorf statement in 19, uh, late, later 1947. Um, and then there's a long standing uh, set of trials because the people who are involved in the hearings, the Hollywood 10, they are found in contempt of Congress. So the majority of the hearings that people associate with the House on American Activities Committee don't start taking place until 1949 and they move throughout the country. This is Dalton Trumbo's subpoena 
to come before the House and American Activities Committee. When I found this subpoena at the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research, I thought maybe they were doing a little pink washing here and that they gave him a pink subpoena because he was a pinko red commie, you know, that kind of, but no, actually they must have just had pink paper in the house at that point and everybody's subpoena is pink, whether they were friendly or unfriendly witnesses, which the, uh, the committee identified before these people came in. So Dalton Trumbo is one of 19 men who were called to testify as unfriendly witnesses. Only 11 of them actually testified and they were all called because of their supposed connections to the Communist Party. Here are the, the people who were uh, leading the hearings. Um, and actually, let's, uh, you know, so one of these people is highly recognizable. He never ages, or he ages, but it just gets more jowly. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, Richard Nixon, yeah, of course. Um, but this was his first committee appointment. He, and really his political clout comes from being on this. He was very involved in other aspects of QX work. Um, and so one of the things that Jay Parnell Thomas and the rest of this committee really finds is that they can, they can use this as a way, as a way of building political currency, as building uh, their, their cachet, building their reputation, because this is actually getting reported on in a way that other parts of government work are not. So the hearings themselves, and I think this was always a challenge, is that they are hearings, they're not trials. You have no ability to come forward and say, wait, I want to see the evidence that you have. Uh, you can't count, you can't cross-examine the people who are bringing evidence against you potentially. And it's really just supposed to be fact-finding. The question at hand, and this is where I think what you think of, and as we're all sitting here, I want you to say aloud in your rooms right now, what is the question at hand in the House on American Activities Committee in 1947? What were they concerned about? And I can see some people, if you're not saying it, probably the thing that you think of is, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? That was the question that most people consider. The actual point of the hearings was to discover if there was communist subversion in Hollywood films. And so when you listen to say Ronald Reagan's response to this, it's going to very much be about whether there's communist subversion in Hollywood films. I will apologize in advance. This is audio from uh, 1947 and it's pulled from YouTube. So it's not amazing, but I think you can get a kernel of what he's trying to say. We have done a pretty good job in our business of keeping those people's activities curtailed. We have, after all, we must legally recognize them at the present as a political party. On that basis, we have exposed their lies when we came across them. We have been eminently successful in preventing them from their usual tactic of trying to run a majority of an organization with a well-organized minority. So it's about this question of Ronald Reagan is there as the president of the Screen Actors Guild. This is his first appearance before Congress. This is his first real big political moment. Um, and at this point, Ronald Reagan had not been defined as this ardent anti-communist that we, he becomes known for in the 1950s. He's still kind of forming that identity. But the question really is, is the Screen Actors Guild impacted by its communist members? And is that impacting what's going on to screens? And you say, no, no, it's not really an issue here. Compare that to Herbert Bieberman, who's one of the Hollywood 10, one of the unfriendly witnesses, and the questions that are posed to him. Uh, Mr. Bieberman, are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild, or have you ever been a member of the Screenwriters Guild? Now, Mr. Stribling, I would like to reply to this very quietly, Mr. Chairman also. If I will not be interrupted, I will attempt to give you a full answer to this question. It has become very clear to me that the real purpose of this investigation... That is not... That is Mr. Bieberman, go ahead, ask Mr. Right. Bieberman, are, are you a member of the Communist Party or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It is perfectly clear to me, gentlemen, that... So you can see, totally different tenor, 
not allowing him to answer. And the question he's being asked is not, are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild and have you used that influence as to have you influenced it as a member of the Communist Party? They are just trying to establish a his party membership and whether he's in the guild. Um, the people who were considered unfriendly witnesses did not really get any leeway to testify at all. Most of them had similar encounters as Mr. Bieberman there, where everything becomes adamant and uh, you know there's there's gavel throughout and there's not a lot of time for discourse and most of them are dismissed within a minute and a half of starting as opposed to Ronald Reagan who gets kind of a respectful silence as do the rest of the uh, friendly witnesses and here just to do a quick rundown you... here are the and and there are many 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 more friendly witnesses but I wanted to pull some of the most notable names of those friendly witnesses most of these people are people who have name recognition still today. I would question, you probably are a pretty deep film fan if you're like Adolf Manchu, of course, I know exactly who he is. But otherwise, you've heard of Ronald Reagan and Louis B. Mayer and Jack Warner, Walt Disney. These are much people with much more power and people who are much better known uh, in American society in 1947 when the hearings are happening, as opposed to the 10 people who were called as unfriendly witnesses. I said there were 19 who were subpoenaed, only 11 were called. These 10 become known as the Hollywood 10. They all refuse to testify and they refuse on their first, they, they call on their first amendment freedoms. They say, they don't say we're taking the fifth, they say we're taking the first. That whatever question you're asking should be totally uh, acceptable because we as American citizens can have uh, membership in a political party. We can have, we can write whatever we want. These are the things that should be legitimate um, under the First Amendment. And so they take their First Amendment rights and they refuse to testify or they, or they have a similar interaction as uh, Herbert Bieberman did in that, um, in that video. And then you have Bertolt Brecht, who is the writer of the Three Penny Opera. He had come to the US in the 1930s to escape Nazi oppression. And he does actually agree to testify. He says, I'm a guest in this country. He's the 11th. Um, and then the next day he leaves and moves to back to Austria and never comes back to the United States again. So there's this interesting you know, feeling of like for Brecht where yes, he was affiliated with the Communist Party but he doesn't want to see what America is like at this point after that. And he immigrates out. Um, so there's very little power within this group of writers. They're mostly writers. There's a producer and a director in there as well, but the majority of them are writers and they don't have a lot of you know, public notoriety um, to this point. So it's not like the public's going to be really concerned if Herbert Bieberman is not able to work. There's a huge number of celebrities from all sorts of different walks that come in and say, we are going to support the rights of these unfriendly witnesses. We feel like blacklisting is bad. And this is a picture of them in front of, uh, the, uh, in front of the Capitol. I'm sure here, as opposed to Herbert Bieberin and Alva, Alva Bessie and Albert Maltz, there are people in this picture you probably recognize. I'm guessing Humphrey Bogart is on the top of most people's list. Also pictured there is Danny Kaye and Lauren Bacall, um, Paul Heinrich. Um, June Havoc, you know, there, there are a number of really notable celebrities and they are petitioning on behalf of the Hollywood 10 to say, and this is before they're the Hollywood 10, but on, on behalf of the unfriendly witnesses to say, we don't support this. So this is what they said actually before the hearings even happen. They send the following uh, petition and the last part of this, any attempt to curb freedom of expression and to set arbitrary standards of Americanism is in itself disloyal to both the spirit and the letter of our constitution. And again, this is another list of people with far more notable names, uh, including Katherine Hepburn and William Wyler, Billy Wilder, like a much more well-known group of celebrities. And they take this on, they come, they sit in the, the hearings, and they're there to provide support. They also have a two night radio show in which you get everybody from Gene Kelly to Frederick March, you know, progress, professing their progressive values and how this would be anti-American if we were to 
enact anything against the people who are being who are being called to testify. So one question I often get is, yeah, well, it was anti-Semitism, right? Like that's that's like the number one question I get after, yeah, but why haven't you talked about Joseph McCarthy yet? So um, I wanna go back to this list of gentlemen. Six out of the 10 Hollywood 10 are Jewish. And there are a number of people who are involved in the Committee for the First Amendment, also Jewish. And then there are people like this guy, John Rankin, who is a Democratic Senator from Mississippi, who is also a member of the Ku Klux Klan. One of the early challenges to the House and American Activities Committee in the 1930s is there were a group of, of representatives who wanted to do hearings into the Klan and its un-American activity. And there were a lot of people like John Rankin who were members who said, what are you talking about? It's the most American of American institutions. This was his response to uh, the Committee for the First Amendment putting out this question to, to the committee to say, you can't, you know, this is about American values and we can't curtail freedom of expression. He says, they sent this petition to Congress and I want to read you some of their names. One of the names is June Havoc. We found that her real name is June Hovick. Another one was Danny Kay, and we found out his real name was Daniel David Daniel Kaminsky. They are attacking this committee for doing its duty to protect this country and save the American people from the horrible fate the communists have meted out to the unfortunate Christian people of Europe. So for John Rankin, this is certainly a question of anti-Semitism. I don't think for the majority of the people involved it is. I'm not going to say, I think there's always this question of communist influence and Jewish integration that comes up throughout this period. And I think one of the things that we find because of that is that the Jewish community remains pretty quiet about, as a organized Jewish community, that there's not a lot of very loud response, because I think there is a sense of nervous anxiety about being labeled as a fellow traveler, traveler or being pink listed in the same way. So you do have some anti-Semitism, but I will say the majority of this is a little bit more nuanced than say John Rankin. I wanna jump into questions. I wanna take this moment to stop sharing because our next piece gets to the next level. And I know I threw a lot of history out there, but Julia, what do you got for me? Um, I don't have too much yet, although just as you were about to, just, just as you were beginning that last piece, there was a question about, you know, to what extent did anti-Semitism play a role in the, in the choice of witnesses and the choice of questions? Um, so I don't know if you, want to, if you want to say anything more about that now. I think the choice of witnesses was really a question, um, and actually here, I want to go back to my slideshow for one second. Um, this, uh, this screen here, where you see that there's stars and check marks, uh, that these are all people, because this came in before, this came in, I think, in the summer of 1947. So before they'd fully decided who they were going to call. And this is actually from the National Archives. This is part of the committee's record from uh, the National Archives. And you can see that there's stars and check marks. So I kind of, I, and I, I was never able to confirm this, but I think these might've been people that they were considering calling and none of these people are called. And all of these people have much more high profiles than the, uh, the people that they called. Um, to some extent, I think they called people, you know, Dalton Trumbo and John Howard Lawson were well known within the Hollywood community as active members of the Communist Party. John Howard Lawson, who's one of the Hollywood 10, had been um, the president of the Screenwriters Guild. So I think that they were prominent uh, leftist people. All 10 of the Hollywood 10 had had some sort of membership in the Communist Party some of them more active, some of them less active. And many of the people, as this goes forward, we find less activity more in the, the realm of being in fellow traveler kind of situation. But I don't think that their specific, their Judaism was the thing they were fixated on. I think it was finding people with the kind of right level of, you needed someone who had some experience and some clout in the industry. All of, most of these people had written 
pretty well-received movies um, or had produced well-received movies. In the case of Adrian Scott, it's interesting. He was a producer um, who had produced a, a couple of films that dealt with anti-Semitism, but he was not Jewish. Uh, and in fact, the, the two, in 1947, there were two movies nominated for Best Picture, both of which dealt with anti-Semitism very seriously. One, the better known of which is Gentleman's Agreement. The less well-known with, and we'll see if, if anybody else is like gonna say, yes, of course, it's Crossfire. Um, and Crossfire is a film noir in which a uh, guy is killed and it turns out it's all about anti-Semitism, spoiler alert. It's, it's been 75 years, so I think I'm okay. Um, and none of the Jewish studio heads wanted to produce these particular movies. They were produced outside of, they were produced at studios that were led by non-Jewish people because there was this real anxiety by the Jewish studio heads of saying, we don't want to put this in the front and center. We're not going to put anti-Semitism up front. And yet Adrian Scott and, um, and I believe it was RKO produced at least one of those two. Uh, that they were like, wait, no, this is important. We want to we want to see this social issue out. Okay, now I have tons of questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now it's hard to choose. Um, well, you you mentioned that um, that the committee kind of uh, you know got excited about the Hollywood angle because it's you know it's kind of accessible and and um, and exciting for the public. Um, was that was that um, did that prove to be a good move strategically? Did, like, did it kind of drum up the sentiment that they wanted? Were people, how, how focused was the public on these hearings? They definitely got more publicity than your average run of the mill hearings. Um, you know, and part of that had to do with the fact that you have Humphrey Bogart standing in front of the Capitol. Um, they neither, so the hearings were kind of a PR snafu for both the committee and the Hollywood 10, neither side comes off looking great. The he committee doesn't seem to know what they're doing. Uh, the press is pretty like, why are they calling this? It doesn't seem like they have a real sense of what they're investigating. They don't really seem to have much evidence to support this claim that there's communist subversion. Um, and on the flip side, they're, they they don't really appreciate the fact that the people, the unfriendly witnesses have acted according to their conscience and that they are just putting things out there. They feel like they haven't done a great job stating their case about why they should be allowed to have any membership because they didn't say anything about those memberships. Um, there were a few more questions about about Jewish studio heads and producers. Um, so you just said that they kind of didn't want to touch it. Um, but I don't know if there's more that you can say about that. People are asking, did they support any of the, you know, the Jewish artists and writers? Were they, were there any who were friendly HUAC witnesses? No. Um, were there, wait, were they friendly witnesses? Yes, like Jack Warner, Louis B. Mayer, friendly witnesses. Dory Sherry, who's a really complicated character, he wasn't, in the, he wasn't in the realm of say a Jack Warner, who's a studio head. He was at the next level right under, but was like a president of a, of a studio. Um, he's probably the most conflicted about this. And the thing that's interesting is many of these Jewish studio heads had had a lot of, had been very active during World War II in a number of different ways. Some like Carl Lemley uh, at Universal who had really worked hard to get people to the United States. Others like Jack Warner who felt like he's gonna make as many uh, pro-America films during World War II to really drum up uh, this sense of populist fervor. Um, and to that end, and we'll see this out in a little bit where he's producing films that are very, um, that are pro-Soviet Union because pro-Soviet Union is pro our ally, the Soviet Union, and we want everyone to be on board with the war efforts. Um, by the time we get to this period, they're actually a little annoyed by, by the guilds. Remember, the guilds come into play in the 1930s, early 1940s. By this point, Walt Disney in particular, he's not Jewish, but has been felt incredibly burned by the, the uh, guilds uh, of cartoonists. And they went on strike, and he felt that that was very much led by communist agitation. Um, and so that's one of the things that the studio heads are not super sad to see this group of people go because they have been agitating for more rights for the artists and the, the writers and 
to some extent the actors, all of this, remember in the studio system, everybody is owned basically by their studio. If you write for Warner Brothers, you're writing as much as you can. Warner Brothers has complete control of what they're producing. You're not going out and shopping your scripts at any of the other places. And the same goes if you're an actor or actress, you know, you might be doing three to five movies a year for MGM, but you don't have any control of what those three to five movies are. You're just on a contract. Um, and so this is a really tenuous period where the, uh, the people we think of today as being the artistic talent as opposed to the, to the money behind uh, film don't have that much power within the film and they're trying to exert that sense of power. And the studios don't really want that <laughs> to happen because that's clearly gonna hurt their bottom line. <laughs> That's interesting. So we could kind of see a correlation on um, um, how people responded to this or what role they played um, with what studio they were part of. Some, so someone asked, um, didn't Humphrey Bogart become neutral or turn against the defendants in the Oh, 50s? well, someone's got my tangent ready or, or my, my next slide after this. I have two slides to go. You're going to, yes. Are, are, should we move on then if, that's, if they're setting Humphrey Bogart up so um, Sure, I was I was just wondering if that was because of what studio he was part of, but yeah, we could use that as a segue and, and there and we can come back to the other question. And it's, by the way, it's not just what studio and that actually, this is a perfect segue into the next, you know, all the thing about the blacklist and the thing that makes it unique and different is that there are like seven major, there are five major studios and then like six or seven other studios and they all sign on to this. So if, and it's, we live in a world right now where if I decided I wanted to be a content creator and I'm going to make my web channel on YouTube and I can produce whatever I want to get it out into the universe, it's out there. That was not a means that was uh, that was available. And so producing a movie and getting any sort of distribution on a movie and getting things out to an audience in 1947, 48 throughout this period is basically impossible without the distribution of some sort of studio. And so... Let's move on to this next uh, this next idea because I think really whoever asked that question just gave me the perfect segue. If my slide decides to work, okay. So a group of executives meet um, from all of the studios, and this is a closed door meeting at the Waldorf Astoria here in New York. Um, and it's very shortly after, less than six weeks after the hearings have commenced, have ended. Um, and they are all present. And in, in, the, um, in the packet, the source material, I include the full body of the Waldorf statement. And I also include the participants, uh, the notable participants in the Waldorf. Um, conference. And so they basically, after this two-day conference, feeling at this point in this six weeks intense pressure from the government to do something, that they are going to initiate a blacklist. And this is the statement. We will not knowingly employ a communist or a member of any party or group which advocates the overthrow of the government of the United States by force or by an illegal or unconstitutional method. Now, the one thing you should know is this is not new to studios. Um, through In the 1930s, there was pressure from the government to censor sexuality and violence and the role of women and all of these sorts of things in movies. There's a lot of great books about this, but if you watch movies before 1932, you see a lot different, there's a, women have a very different role on screen than if you start watching after 1933. And that's because they instituted the Hayes Code basically to preempt the government from coming in and saying, this is appropriate, this is not appropriate. They wanted that kind of control on their own. And again, they are saying, we don't want the government to tell us who can and can't work. We're gonna take this over ourselves. So while the blacklist was certainly came out of the HUAC hearings, the blacklist is actually totally run by the studios themselves. Um, and it is a function of them saying, we want to make sure that our business isn't impacted by American Legion um, boycotts or by the government saying they're not going to help us, um, you know, get back into foreign markets, or maybe because this assists with our uh, try, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court case that's coming about um, separating distribution from, from the executives, the studios themselves. So they are saying, we're taking this into our own account. 
And very quickly, there is a dial back by the stars of Bogart's kind of uh, level, where they, they quickly take stances in a number of different ways to say, that wasn't me. I'm not, I'm not involved. I don't want to do this. And, and they have all sorts of different ways. One of the reasons why Bogart ends up shooting the African queen actually, and most of that cast ends up in Africa shooting African queen, because this was a way of saying, look, we're off the radar. Just we're shooting this film in Africa. It's a great movie though. <laughs> um, so Bogart puts out in, and actually it's say March of 1948, so that's less than six months after he had been so publicly in favor of the Hollywood 10 and supporting the rights of those who were uh, publicly out there. He is now in Photoplay Magazine. Again, this is in Time or Newsweek. He is putting this out to the people, film fans. He wants, you know, he wants the studios to know that he's in line and he's saying, this is what I love this article. I think it's so great because it sounds very much like whoever his publicist is understood how we think Bogart would talk. The New York Times, the Herald Tribune, and other reputa reputable publications editorial had questioned the House Committee on Un American Activities, warning uh, that it was infringing on free speech. When a group of us Hollywood actors and actresses said the same thing, the roof fell in on us. In some fashion, I took the brunt of the attack. Suddenly, the plane had flown us east. East became Bogart's plane, carrying Bogart's group. For once, top billing became embarrassing. And he ends this by saying, uh, the public, I figured, knew me and had known me for years. Sure, I'd campaigned for FDR, but that had been the extent of my participation in politics. The public, um, I figured, must be aware of that and must be aware that not only was I completely American, but sincerely grateful for what the American system had allowed me to achieve. And you get these kinds of parv responses or they're not even parv they're very you know pro-american oh yes i can talk a bit slower thank you julia um i get so excited um that they they get these kinds of you know tepid like oh of course i was supporting these people but really i'm not i'm totally american um and you see them from all angles where uh and in all sorts of different publications um, Elia Kazan, after he testifies, takes a full page out in the New York Times to, you know, really not just say I was pushed into doing this, but to say I wanted to do this and this is why. This is, you know, communism is ruining American liberalism, which was one big argument that was being made at that time. Um, so you see these in all sorts of different media. Did you want to ask? It, because we dealt with this, did you want to get to more questions or should I keep going on the next kind of part of this? Um, one question directly on this was if you could go back to that photo and, and identify those five. Oh, can I? I don't know that I can identify these five men. I, I, I should have had their pictures. I know one of them is Jack Warner and I know one of them is Carl Lemley and one of them is Spiros Skiros, who is the head of RKO, he was kind of the big non-Jewish guy. Okay. And maybe by the end I will have everybody. But the problem with the studio executives as opposed to Humphrey Bogart is their faces are all very similar. But it's, it's it's the big studio executives. It's the big, these are the big studio execs who are there. Yeah. Um thanks. So we'll keep going forward and then I have another breaking point kind of in the middle. Uh, because now I really want to get into this sense. This is the outcome of the, the, the Waldorf Agreement says that the people who were in the Hollywood 10 can't work, but nobody else had been at this point accused publicly of being a communist. And it doesn't, it doesn't really come into a full effect until 1949. From 1947 to 1949, the um, Hollywood 10 are found in contempt of Congress. And the vote for that is crazy skewed in the way that you never see votes today in Congress going where it's like 380 to 115 or something in a number of abstentions. It's a very, you know, people are very much like, yes, these people are in contempt of Congress. Contempt of Congress comes with a jail sentence and a $5,000 fine. And so for the next year and a half, there is a slow process of getting the case of the Hollywood 10 where they're appealing their contempt um, in Congress through the court system, up through the federal court system. 
the top federal court says, we find that they are guilty. You can't, taking the First Amendment is not a valid defense. And we are going to say, yes, you do have to serve jail time and you do have to um, pay the fine. It goes to the Supreme Court. And at which point in 1947, the Hollywood 10 felt pretty optimistically if this got to the court, then they were going to be scot-free. It was going there. The court was going to hear it. The court in that year and a half had changed over drastically. Uh, there were Truman appointees, but in Truman's appointees had, are much more centrist as opposed to the lefties, the FDR lefties who had died in those two years and they refused to hear the case. So the Hollywood 10 go to jail. And at that point, 1949, HUEC then expands this question of communism in films, and they move a lot of the hearings to LA. So this person here, um, this is why you have to write your, the names on the slideshow, because in this moment, I'm like, he and somebody's going to come up with it for me, Julia, and they're going to tell you in chat. He was in um, the he was in the jazz singer, the the autobiography of the jazz singer, and he, was, he had been nominated for an Oscar, Larry Parks. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I see that you're nodding and like, of course that was Larry Parks. Larry Parks had been nominated for an Oscar in 1947. He's seen as an actor with, you know, kind of an upside at this point. He's not young, but he's, he's got, um, he's getting roles and he's called to testify in LA. And he spends the day in this test of, in this hearing where he's, just, he's saying, I guess I was in the Communist Party, but I haven't been a member in X number of years. I haven't been involved in forever. I'm happy to tell you anything about how the party operates. And the people within the committee keep saying, you have to tell us everything about who's in the party. It's really about who's in the party, not what happened in the party. To this end, you know, Donald Jackson, uh, the representative from California, is saying the ultimate test of the credibility of witness is the extent to which he is willing to cooperate with the committee and giving full details of the names of those who are communists. So the names are really important. At the end of the day, they finally move into an executive session with Larry Parks, and he says, okay, and they promise it will be secret. And of course, it's not. Everything gets out. And Larry Parks is then vilified by the left because he caved. And on the right, they refused to let him work again because he didn't do it willingly. It was, you know, it was pulled out of him. So Larry Parks ends his days in dinner theater, I believe in New Jersey. Um, and so that's the kind of, you know, that suddenly it's not about just talking about whether you're a communist, it's that you have to tell who you saw at the meetings and what you did. And there are a number of reasons why people uh, bowed to the pressure. Some, like Bud Schulberg here, uh, he's the guy on the, that, with, that says personal history underneath, felt really happy to talk, to name names because he felt that the party had limited his voice. He had written What Makes Sammy Run, um, a book made into a musical. It was made into lots of things about an agent in Hollywood. And the party came back to him. In fact, John Howard Lawson came back to him and said, you can't publish this. This is not a good message for uh, the Communist Party. So the Communist Party also involved in censorship here, um, since that's the theme of our, of, our, of our series. And he said, well, I'm through with that then. And he published his book, it became successful. And so when he was called to testify, he was very happy to share names and to tell people because he felt like, you know, they had thwarted me and now I'm going to thwart them. Jerome Robbins is in the middle here. And he testified uh, because he was incredibly afraid that his homosexuality would come out in hearings. Um, and that if they, if, if they knew about his sexual, uh, his, his, his life, that they would, he would be blacklisted anyway. So he felt like he had to cooperate. And then Lee J. Cobb, and Lee, both Lee J. Cobb and Bud Schulberg were uh, involved in On the Waterfront, which has lots of very interesting blacklist connections. Um, he felt that if he didn't testify, that his family wasn't going to eat. And he, you know, he had already lost so much work by kind of, by, by being in this kind of liminal state between, is he going to testify, is he not? So he testified because he, he had young children and he just wanted to ensure that they were supported. 
Um, and yet you see a number of people who decide not to testify for the same set of reasons, maybe not so much the personal fears. But the blacklist then, anybody who chooses not to testify is blacklisted. If you are named, you're blacklisted and they're whole entities within the studio system um, that basically each studio runs their own clearinghouse. So it is possible that there are people who are blacklisted within one system that wouldn't be within the other. And it moves into things like television, um, theater never blacklists, um, but television very much takes this on pretty much as soon as television starts becoming a thing because they're very much worried about advertisers and, uh, and losing advertisers. And also as a new medium, they're very afraid about what's going to be considered appropriate or not appropriate and what they're going to get, uh, what they're not going to be able to show at all. This is one of those things now that we're, I wanna talk about kind of how American film content changes. This is before the, as the Waldorf statement is coming in, this is a response, another Hollywood response. This was in, uh, I think, Daily Variety um, as a kind of full page ad they took out. If you see on the bottom there, the Freedom From Fear Committee. These are people who are not nearly as well known as our America, you know, Hollywood for the First Amendment group. All of the people listed there are blacklisted or end up naming names. So all of these people are connected to um, leftist causes, some of them to the Communist Party, but all of them end up being impacted. And one of the things in this like checklist, you know, cause these are mostly writers who are putting this in there and um, uh, is that they, and they come up with all sorts of things. Are you nervous about who you sit with? You know, or you think about changing your name or you disturbed because you're a Jew, a Catholic, a union or guild member or Freemason. The one that I think really indicates how this impacts broader Hollywood is this one, number four. Are you giving up that idea for a story or changing a scene just a little? And it becomes a big part of the blacklist is really not just that you're limiting who is working in Hollywood, but you're changing the tenor of what stories are told in American film. Um, and that's the piece that I think had the longest, the impact of the Hollywood blacklist is there are 300 or so people who aren't working in this time period, but the impact of this aspect of the Hollywood blacklist is much longer lasting. So let's look at some of the ways in which they're checking content in Hollywood films. So what you're looking at in very, and I, and I put a link in the sources, not just to these two pieces, we're gonna look at two movies, but I actually put a link into uh, the internet archive version of all of these. These are the FBI files on Hollywood movies. So starting as early as 1941, in the middle of World War II, the FBI starts watching Hollywood wood films for subversion. And this one, Mission to Moscow, is a Warner Brothers film. Remember I said Jack Warner really felt it was his patriotic duty to make sure he's getting these out here. And this one in particular was sent to him by FDR. FDR sent him a book written by Joseph Davies, who was his um, uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And he says, we need to make this movie because we need to see how Russia really operates. Now, Joseph Davies had not seen the full extent of how Russia operated in the 1930s. And this is pretty much a whitewashing of uh, the 1930s show trials and purges and those sorts of things. It basically is saying, look, they were all fascist and that's why they were taken out of, out of communist uh, Russia. Um, so there are lots, this is problematic in a number of ways, but not necessarily in a way that say Jack Warner or the writers um, would have known in that period. And they're set talking about, you know, and one of the things I can tell you from watching this film is that uh, Joseph Stalin is a character in the film and looks, he's, he's the most lovely, serene gentleman you can imagine. Um, so there, it's, it's problematic, but it was also one of the, pieces of American propaganda that was being developed in this time period because they wanted to show, you know, our allies in Russia were just like us, that look, this is a good country too. 
this is who we're fighting with. We're fighting together because they felt like that was an important um, aspect to winning the hearts and minds of Americans during World War II. Um, Jack Warner, in response to questions about this at the HUAC hearings in 1947, said, if you're talking about movies like this, it's as if we were we were taking, we were like the supply chain that was providing food behind um, Nazi lines. You know, that's the same idea for him, that he really had this sense that he was doing something that was not just, um, he wasn't just making a movie, he was making something to, to change the way that America could win this war. On the flip side, you have movies later on that, and this one is a very well-known film, Best Years of Our Lives. It won Best Picture, uh, I believe in 1946. Um, and it looks at three soldiers who've just come back from World War II and their responses. And their responses are not all lovely and wonderful. Um, and they're having, they're having challenging times, certainly in the realm of probably what we'd call today PTSD. Um, one of the things that they point to as a moment of subversion is uh, that the banker comes in, and again, this is in your sources, and um, one scene which is discussed as illustrating his point occurred when Frederick March went to see his boss, the banker, to tell the latter that he, March, had made a loan to a GI. Once March turned away, the banker's face changed and he registered disapproval of the former's action. This tended to show the banker as a mean individual. So that is the communist subversion, that the banker is a mean individual. I want you guys to see what that looks like in a second. Before I do, I wanna to get to one other way in which Hollywood starts changing the tenor of the way books, uh, movies are written. Uh, and they actually commission Anne Rand to create a screen guide for Americans. And again, I have a link to the full text of the screen guide in your sources. It's an easy read. It's like a 12 page document. But these are the things that she's looking at. Don't smear industrialists. Well, I know, I don't know if anybody's watched It's a Wonderful Life in the last week, but smears an industrialist. Don't smear wealth. Don't smear the profit mode. Don't smear success. Don't glorify a failure. Don't glorify depravity. Um, probably no show that we watched today would work on that because we certainly have a way of glorifying depravity. This one is always a challenge to me that you can't deify the common men, but you also can't smear an independent man. But what if your common man is also the independent man? You know, she's putting all sorts of things out there, but this then becomes a framework for studios as they're producing movies to go through and kind of checklist it. Well, have we uh, smeared American political institutions? Do we use current events carelessly? Any of these things, which again, changes the way in which movies are made and what sorts of stories are being uh, actually taken into production. So let's take a moment to see this in, in practice, what would be controversial in uh, best years of our life? And give me a second, I have to move this to uh... What's his name? Novak. Yes, yes, I approved it. Well, may I ask, Al, on what basis? On the basis of my own judgment. Novak looked to me like a good bet. But the man has no collateral, no security. Evidently, you saw something in this man. Yes, right? Mr. Milton. But what was it? Uh, security. Collateral. You see, Mr. Milton, in the Army, I've had to be with men when they were stripped of everything in the way of property except what they carried around with them and inside them. I saw them being tested. Now, some of them stood up to it and some didn't. But you got so you could tell which ones you could count on. I tell you, this man Novak is okay. His collateral is in his hands and his and his heart and his guts. It's in his right as a citizen. Nobody's denying him his rights. Oh yes, we are. If we deny him his chance to work in oh, his own way, that... gentlemen, there's no need to raise our voices. Of course, since you've approved the loan, the incident is closed. However, in the future, Al. Yes, I, I understand, Mr. Milton. In the future, I must exercise more caution. I hope you guys all saw that subversion. It was very clear, right? Do you see his face went from being kind of plain to frowning? That was it. That, that's what the FBI was looking at there. 
And they have records, I think there are 120 something movies that have records from the FBI, which tells you that there is a number of people on this at that time that were really thinking through what did they think of as subversion. Um, I think this is where, after this slide, I'd like to take another break um, and then we can talk a little bit more. So in this moment there, you know, it's not just that we're not gonna talk about this. They actually make a real statement to say, we'll have no more grapes of wrath, we'll have no more tobacco roads and we'll have no more films that deal with the seamy side of American life. We'll have no more films that treat, treat the bankrupt as a villain. And so you have this incredible shift in the movies that are being produced, ones that have social and political content um, to ones that are very much more in the realm of commercial and blockbuster. And there are a couple of reasons for this aside from the blacklist. So before I get to, you know, the other big thing that's that's happening in this time period is television is coming in. And so there is this push by studios to make the product that is in theaters in some ways different than what you can see at home. They have to differentiate themselves and say, look, we are making spectacle pieces. And so you get some really big Cecil B. DeMille, 10 Commandments like, um, dramas because how is that going to translate to your 12 inch TV? No, you're never, that's never going to be the thing that you want to see there. You want to see that in CinemaScope and you want to see that in huge, you know, at your theater. So they do make these kinds of more tentpole blockbuster films. The other thing is they start using color for those films in particular because color television doesn't come in for a while and it's a way again of differentiating. But beyond the fact that they have this, this threat of TV, there's also this kind of ongoing threat of saying, what we're exporting here doesn't just impact the United States. This is an export that shows people all over the world what's going on in America. So if we are showing movies like Crossfire or um, other movies that show racism or or sexism or any of these things, that that's what people are going to think about America. And so we're going to limit this. In 1947, 28% of Hollywood films had some sort of social or political content. By 1952, that number is 8%, which shows that the blacklist and this entire period really shifts the way movies are made and what sorts of movies are made. So I'm ready for some questions. Okay, great. Um, so someone someone commented, um, sorry, someone commented a while back, um, you know how how times have changed since the Waldorf statement. I think this the Ayn Rand th that list. Um, someone else commented, you know that list leaves only cartoons. Um, and not even right cartoons could be subversive. There's lots of things. Also, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's. Um, you know the, the things that she, the things that she's uh, you know guiding us to to post red flags on um, is is so much what dominates um, films today. I just finished watching Wednesday with my kids, which you can all question that on your own. But certainly, depravity is at the center of what they are putting on on show at Wednesday, and like you know, our whole focus of the last probably decade and a half has been the anti-hero in anything from Mad Men to Breaking Bad and all of those, that universe of television. Um, I think, you know, also the common man and sort of um, anti-industry and I can think of so many movies that are, that are like the Robin Hood kind of. Um, yeah, well, and, and to the fact that Robin Hood who is who's already a cultural icon and certainly a cultural icon throughout the 1930s, you know, in the depression, you know, that that is a, that by, 10 years after that, that kind of movie wouldn't have been made in the same way. So you were saying that that kind of the the um, kind of the big visual epics, that that's part of um, where the shift went uh, away from these these kinds of issues. And is that is that sort of the big are there other key shifts that you would point us to? Um, I would point to if you look at 
you know, kind of the frothy musicals of the 1950s, anything from Gigi to, uh, you know, Pajama Game, all of those sorts of things where you don't have complicated relationships between men and women. You don't have, um, and really you see more of the kind of, well, those sorts of movies. And then you do get some very notable social and political dramas that come out in this period. I'm sure there are people who are sitting at home saying, yeah, but what about the brave one? Not the brave one, actually. What about the wild one? What about, what about Viva Zapata? What about On the Waterfront or High Noon? And these movies do exist, but they almost seem to be more notable because they weren't the sorts of movies that were being made in big numbers. Um, and one of the things that happens as we move out of the 1950s and the studio system crumbles is certain, and you see the power of the auteur director and writers of the 60s and 70s, that it is in almost a kind of direct response to the movies that weren't getting made of the 1950s. If you look at like what universe Coppola and, uh, and all of those, those people, uh, Scorsese and all of the people of the 19, uh, early 70s, late 60s are coming in there in that crucible of that specific time that most of this is saying, these aren't the movies that we're gonna be making anymore. Um, and, and they didn't have to because the studios no, no longer had the power to say, these are the movies you're making. Studios then had to buy scripts and work through production and, and both directors and writers had more, us, more power. They're still, the power balance is always a little bit questionable in Hollywood. The other place where I think you really see this um, is television. Um, and television is coming into its own in this moment. And if I were to ask you, think about television from the 1950s, I'm guessing, you know, the play, are Leave it to Beaver, um, you know, Father Knows Best, the Donna Reed Show. And, and in some cases, I Love Lucy is kind of revolutionary because you have a woman at the center. Um, as com compared to, say, even you know, the 10 years previously where you had a lot more diversity in roles uh, for people in radio. Um, the one kind of big exception is the Goldbergs that that existed and had, and, and has very resonant blacklist connections. The father on the Goldbergs, Philip Loeb commits suicide because he's blacklisted. And at, at one, at first Gertrude Berg is saying, no, I'm gonna support. And then she has to pull back. And I think one of the things that you see if, um, in this period is that TV becomes a way of asserting an America that doesn't exist. And then that becomes a way for us moving forward for the next like 40 years of when people are hearkening back to pop culture, they're like, yeah, but leave it to Beaver. We need that kind of America. And as we all know, America was never leave it to Beaver. And yet that's that because that's what our culture shows. That's what people hold up. Someone just said Lucille Ball was actually a former member of the Communist Party. She was. Her grand and her father and grandfather were very active members. Um, but she, and one of the things that I found is that if you're someone like Lucille Ball, if you're someone like Gene Kelly, if you're someone like Judy Holliday, that you tend to find that the studio goes to bat for you in a way that, because these are people who had connections to the Communist Party. Um, but the studio would go to bat for them because they were money makers, they were big stars, they were uh, in a way that they didn't go to bat for others. And we'll get to that kind of feeling in the next in the next block. Um, okay, uh, there. I have so many questions. Do you do you want to take some more? Let me let me go into the next block and then we'll finish up. Okay. We'll wrap up. But uh, this is a shorter of this is my shortest block. Um, So this is an actor of that same period, John Garfield. He was in many movies, Pride of the Marines. Uh, he was the kind of second lead in Gentleman's Agreement. Um, he was a Jewish, uh, original name, I believe is Julius Garfinkel. And John Garfield had been really active in the kind of anti-fascist leftist movements of the 1930s and 40s. Uh, he led the Hollywood Anti-Fascist League. He was not ever a member of the Communist Party, but his wife was. And he is at this point in 1950 is not working. 
and cannot get a job. He's not actually been asked, to t- he, he was asked to testify and kind of plays dumb. I don't know anything about the Communist Party, but doesn't name names. Um, and in 1950, he's writing this letter to Dory Sherry, the producer who we spoke about earlier, who had been a real ally on the left, and produced a number of films that were seen as being socially or politically engaged. And he's saying to him, uh, you know, I'd like to produce, I'd like to be in a movie with you. Um, and there's so many things that are so sad about this letter. It's October, 1950. Uh, he says the terms would be entirely secondary. My schedule is crowded, but it's the kind of picture is what is important. That's why, of course, I'm talking to you about it because I think we think the same on the subject. It's our democracy. Certainly it needs improving all the time. And I'm never going to, out of fear of being unpopular, stop beefing but it is undoubtedly the best in existence by far. And it's so much better than all the dictatorships, including those that pose as people's governments like Russia. I'd like to work on a film which uh, has this as a subject matter. It seems to me that this would be about as timely as picture as one can make. And he says it's gonna be a box office success and he goes on and Sherry, as far as I know, does not reply. And Garfield, who is 39 a year later, dies of a heart attack. And he had felt incredibly pressured by the FBI. They were always hounding him there. You know, he couldn't get work. He had kids to support and he already had a bad heart. And, and, you know, it's not one of the things with were there casualties of the blacklist. Not, you know, no one on the blacklist is officially going out and killing people. But Philip Loeb, uh, John Garfield, uh, Canada Lee, that these are all people who their death, I think, certainly was brought on by the stress of being blacklisted and not being able to work and what that meant. Um, And Sherry, you know, can't do anything with this because he doesn't, while he has some power and some clout to green light films, you know, the studio has said, we're not working with Garfield. Garfield's credentials, meanwhile, were the exact same as Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly, also married to a communist, also involved in leftist activities in the 1930s and 40s. And Gene Kelly continues to work throughout the 1950s. And I think it really is a question of box office stardom. So as I'm ending up, I just want to get to this, how does the blacklist end? It never, there's all sorts of, I'm sure some of you have seen the movie Trumbo and you would say it ends when Kirk Douglas hires Dalton Trumbo to write uh, Spartacus and Otto Preminger hires him to write Exodus and voila, it ends. And that's true for Dalton Trumbo at that moment, the blacklist ended. But for other people who are blacklisted, they have to find their Otto Preminger or their Kirk Douglas, the person who's going to hire them to, to, to be able to write or work. Um, and I found this very compelling case. Albert Maltz had been a writer of a similar notoriety to Dalton Trumbo before the blacklist. And Frank Sinatra is ready to hire him to write a movie. It becomes public. This is after... Uh, after Trumbo has already been publicly recognized as the writer of Exodus and Spartacus. And he says to, you know, he's, Albert Maltz has been hired to write this film and Frank Sinatra puts it out there and then gets a bunch of backlash from the American Legion, from any number of places. And after putting out a full page kind of supportive ad in the New York Times about three weeks later, He rescinds that and publishes this. My conversations with Maltz indicate that he had an affirmative pro-America approach to the story, but the American public has indicated that it feels the morality of hiring Maltz is the most crucial matter, and I will accept this majority opinion. And Maltz didn't work again in film until 1970. So while there's this, you know, yes, by 1960, some people are starting to go back to work and you don't have the entire, institution of the film industry out there supporting blacklists it's still in effect for for many of the people and many people never find their way back into film again and so that's and it's especially true with actors and actresses because you know as you age lee grant is kind of an excellent exception she was in shampoo but she was super young when she was blacklisted like 23 and she had a, uh, and she, she's up front about this. I'm not airing her dirty laundry. She had a, uh, a facelift at a very young age, which made her look even younger as she came back in as a 30 something year old lady, but she had completely skipped that time 
in a Hollywood career in which you can play ingenues and leads and she had to kind of move into kind of more character work, which she was fine with because that's what she wanted to do. But she's an, it's an interesting case altogether. So I think that's, that's all I have prepared and I'm ready for questions and comments and I'm sure there, there are lots. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. This is so fascinating. Okay. Um, well, a few people, a few people asked um, about writers specifically, and just picking up from where you just left off. Um, a few people were under the impression that that some of the writers were able to uh, continue their work in in film and in screenwriting under under false names, and that that producers were aware of that, and you know, but it kind of it was a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing. Um, so, you know, which is different from the situation of an, of an actor, of course. Um, and there was also a question, you know, the writers who weren't able to do that, were they able, were they able to write for newspapers? Could they write for radio? Could they still be in kind of the broader um, media slash entertainment industry? Or were they really kind of thrown out? So let's talk about kind of the options that were open to people at the time. So yes, writers could write under pseudonyms and some did. Writers could write under fronts and many did. Um, each was dangerous uh, in its own way because the front could get actually dinged as being, you know, if that if the truth were to come out, uh, that person could be blacklisted and lose whatever credibility they have. Um, the pseudonym, a, you know, Dalton Trumbo wrote, uh, got an Oscar for a movie called The Brave One about a bull um, under the name Robert Rich. And, you know, some people knew who that it was Dalton Trumbo. Most people didn't. But uh, he also, at in the same time period, uh, he wrote Roman Holiday and Ian McKellen Hunter received the credit for Roman Holiday and the Oscar for Roman Holiday. And then later in in the 1980s, they finally gave uh, Trumbo an Oscar for that as well. Um, but with that said, that the one thing that writing under a front meant is that if you were someone like Dalton Trumbo, who had been a top writer in Hollywood on a huge contract, you're not getting paid at the same. They know the people who are hiring fronts or people under pseudonyms on some level know that they're getting A-list talent for C-list pricing, or maybe even D or E-list. So, you know, and actually one of the things that Kirk Douglas, yes, he looks like a mensch because he hired um, Dalton Trumbo, he broke the blacklist, but he had been aware that many of the people in his stable of writers for his film company, Brian of Films, were blacklisted and he was just getting a deal. Um, so there is this kind of tricky situation where, you know, Bryna is an independent production company that then's working with a larger studio to get their films out there. But there is this kind of shady underbelly of Hollywood that's going on. Many um, blacklisties end up in, in things like B films, uh, where they write like, I think Trumbo actually wrote uh, a, a movie that's like Catwoman from Outer Space, you know, stuff like that, um, that has probably a more polished script than you would expect. Um, I can't say that I've watched Cat Women from Outer Space, but maybe someday. Um, and then for, act, for the, a number of people leave the country. That's in terms of looking at ways in which people can continue to be employed. So they go overseas. There's a group of, of um, there's an enclave in Mexico. They work with Louis Buñuel. There's an enclave in uh, Paris. Um, Jules Dassin famously goes to uh, Greece and marries Melina Mercury and they produce Top Cocky and Never on a Sunday, like big hits in the 1960s. Um, the one of the things that comes up is the State Department actually rescinds passports of anyone who is accused of being a communist. So from 1952, when that happens to 1956, the people who are blacklisted are stuck in whatever country they are then in. And we think about Europe today, it's Eurozone, fine. You're in Italy, that's great. You can go anywhere else. No, you were, you were really limited to, to that one country. Um, and so some of the people stay in exile for the rest of their lives. Other people, after they come back, after the blacklist is kind of dissipated, come back and reestablish uh, working lines for themselves. In terms of do they go into other media, 
Yes, but for the most part, it has to be pretty, the, the way in which, and I'm sure some of the people on this call have family members who were blacklisted in academia and uh, trade unions and other things. So they have to be in a place where it's, where they don't, it doesn't matter as much or they don't seem to care. I know a number of blacklistees end up writing or working on industrial films, like you know, this is the trade, this is the film that shows workman's safety in the steel industry or things like that. Um, and some end up writing under pseudonyms for kind of just in any other format that they can. Uh, so that's that's kind of the way in which they continue to be employed. So someone should- Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more thing to that is actors and actresses do end up you know, theater becomes the safe haven for many of them, but theater play, pays at a much lower level. Um, and so the like question of supporting your family while doing summer stock, or even if you're on Broadway potentially, which some of the people were, Zero Mostel works uh, on Broadway through this period. He has, his famous quote from the time period is, I'm a man of a thousand faces and all of them are blacklisted. Um, and meanwhile, when he is on Fiddler on the Roof, he and Jer Jerome Robbins have a terrible relationship because he feels so bitter the fact that Robbins had testified. And so this, this acrimony exists, you know, and, and yet they are able to still it, to transcend that and create fabulous art together, which I think is a testament to both the time period and their, their willpower to overcome that. Um, I just wanted to read an anecdote that someone shared and then I'll go on to the next question, but it, it related to what you just said a minute ago. So this person was at um, the al camp of Brandeis Bardeen um, Institute in LA um, and, and said, was talking about in the seventies when a lot of campers came from, from film industry families. So um, he shared a, counselor's cabin with the son of Lee Jacob. Oh. Um, and he wrote that, that. You mean Lee Jacoby? I'm just right reading what he wrote. Yeah, no, that was his, <laughs> that's his uh, name before he changed okay. it. Okay. So, so he wrote that this, that he, that this guy still um, had and wore his father's hat from on the waterfront, but also related that there were kids and parents there who would not speak to him due to Mr. Cobb testifying in 1953 for HUAC. So just, in, just uh, right along the lines of what you were saying. Um, I got into this topic in 1999, and I was in high school, 1998, when Elia Kazan was given the honorary Oscar at um, for his Lifetime Achievement. And he's presented by uh, Scorsese, and um, he was the, the priest in On the Waterfront. Someone's going to tell you his name, but it's like here in the back of my head. Um, and, and there's, you know, this great, and anytime you've seen a lifetime achievement award at any event, everyone stands up and claps. There's like this inspirational look. And in this moment, about 70% of the crowd is standing. There's about 30, 25% that is very tepidly sitting and maybe clapping a little and about 5% that is actively booing. And I'm in 1998, that's, you know, 40 years after this, and yet there's still that Carl Malden, thank you, um, that they had that there's still that kind of animosity that I had to know more about this topic. So, and, and still you find that there are people who, um, Zoe Kazan, who is in a number of movies these days, whenever she is in something that kind of deals with the political left, seems to get this question, tell me about your grandfather and why he named names, you know, that it, for this actress who's, you know, 60 years removed from her grandfather's career is still asked about this decision to name names, which he never actually felt bad about for the rest of his life. He always felt like he had done the right thing. Um, there are a lot of questions about the, the whole Jewish angle, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to put um, just a few of them together. Um, I mean, a lot of people were noticing that that these uh, studio execs, a whole bunch of them were Jewish, um, and 
you know, kind of observing um, that, that we kind of have Jews suppressing other Jews. So some of the questions related to that were, um, you know, were the, were the Jewish studio execs potentially even more compliant or was there, was there any kind of correlation or, or the opposite with, um, with blacklist demands? There was also a question, um, you know, did Jews, did Jews in Hollywood feel comfortable or were, were they kind of already feeling um, separate or vulnerable or, um, you know, different in relation to, to their non-Jewish colleagues? Um, so I don't know if there's, if there's, and someone actually, um, I guess Ayn Rand also came from a Jewish family. Um, so, but, but really focusing on the, um, on their uh, Jewish background, the Jewish, yeah, the Jewish backgrounds within the Hollywood community. Do you think that that, do you think that the, those on the Waldorf side, you know, on the, kind of the, on, on the HUAC, the blacklist side, was there, was there anything Jewish actually motivating them? I don't know that they felt extra, they might've felt this extra sense of pressure because there was, and, and I can't speak as much about their internal motivations here because I think their motivation was primarily, we gotta make sure we're not getting boycotted and we're not losing money. Now, do they feel extra pressure because of their Jewish identities? I mean, for most of them, they were pretty assimilated, acculturated American Jews and Hollywood had a huge, population of Jewish people in all parts of the industry. Um, so like, I don't, I think that they, there, it was not, you know, they didn't feel like they were marginalized because they were Jewish because in as much as they, they did have a lot of clout because they had created the studio system, you know? So I don't, but I do think that they felt like they needed to uh, kind of connect. One place in which I actually saw this kind of sense of I would say tepid response and the concern is more from the like Jewish community relations councils and things like that, because they didn't really go out and say, we need to, you know, a lot of Jews are being impacted, not just in Hollywood, but in other fields as well. And we need to really respond. I mean, think about the, the Rosenberg case, all of it. We need to make sure we're responding to Jewish uh, attack, Jewish uh, communist uh, identity questions they felt like they could not make those responses because they were nervous about being targeted as um, fellow traveler organizations. So you don't get a broad Jewish communal response. You don't get say, you know, the, the LA uh, JCRC doesn't do anything. There are some moments in which they're kind of supportive. Um, Edward G. Robinson uses the JCRC of LA to go through all of his financial donations over the last 20 years, which were significant, so that he could demonstrate that he hadn't donated any money to the Communist Party in order to get off of, he was gray listed at that point. He wasn't working, but he wasn't on an official blacklist. Um, so there are places where they're helpful, but I think that's really where you see the broader Jewish community in America is saying, we don't wanna step into this because we are nervous about our position. I don't know that the Hollywood executives felt that in the same way. So, so we're out of time. So just in 10 seconds, um, so oh, there, so there, were, there were, so there were questions about, you know, were rabbis saying anything? Someone was surprised the reform movement wasn't coming out against this. So, so it sounds like they were, they were just part of the same kind of field. I mean, you get some from like the, the very political, very lefty rabbis, people who are, but for the most part, there's not a broad, you know, condemnation of blacklisting. And I will say, I just have to give one plug. This exhibit will be going to the Skirball Institute in LA in um, May. So if you're in the LA area, anywhere where May of through, I think it's somewhere in the fall of 2023, you can check it out. Um, thank you so much, Ellie. This was just so interesting. And, um, you know, and like, like our other sessions, um, I'm thinking especially about Dr. Friedberg's section, session on, um, on Holocaust literature. There's so many, um, you know, the Jewish issues are so enmeshed in the larger, larger mm -hmm. social um, issues and things going on um, in the country. So just thank you so much for kind of bringing us into this incredible research that you've done and all the nuances of it. Um, I will, there are so many more questions that we didn't get to, but I will share them with you. You share them with me. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can yeah. find a way to answer. Um, and I just, I want to thank once again, um, 
Toby Deutsch for sponsoring in memory of your husband, Larry Deutsch. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, so we hope to thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope to see you for our last session um, next week, which will be uh, with Dr. Meredith Katz, who's in our um, William Davidson Graduate School of Education here at JTS teaching on, um, you know, we, we, I mentioned in the beginning, we kind of organized this series chronologically, chronologically. So we'll be ending up with Jewish education today and how, how these insert, uh, issues of censorship um, play in and what responsibilities we have. So hope to see you then. And thank you so much again, Ellie, for teaching us today.